I want to thank everybody in attendance today and everybody who's watching uh, online. Uh, we have, uh, besides the uh, 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 individuals of, of note for, from the Oriental Institute, we have uh, several representatives of the Lithuanian government in attendance today. Uh, from New York, uh, the cultural attache of Lithuanian Consul Grzyna Mikhnevichut is here, uh, and Chicago's cultural attache Eva de Delit is here, and in, uh, from Chicago, the Consul General uh, Sigidra Mulevichiene is here. So thank you very much for coming. Um, when I was growing up in a Lithuanian household, uh, Maria Gimbutis' uh, name was well known to me and her accomplishments. Um, and, and, and it sort of surprised me that uh, what she had done and, and worked on wasn't all that well known or appreciated in the general academic community. A few years ago, I, I watched an interview that she did, and it stunned me the difficulties that she had in, um, here in the United States after the war. Uh, she uh, did, did her, uh, most of her education in Lithuania and archaeological diggings and her research and got her PhD in 1946 in Germany, in Tübingen, and then ended up uh, in Boston with her family, with her two daughters and her husband, and had a position at Harvard University. So you would think that that was uh, really a notable accomplishment, but not when you realize that this was a, 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 uh, a, a, a tabletop in the basement of the Peabody Museum with no salary, no title, no position, but work, uh, research, publications, uh, and translating articles for her colleagues. Uh, it was, it, she considered this an act of, of, of misogyny, which it was, but I think in addition there was an anti-immigrant bias, strong bias in her case too, which my family went through in Canada. The, uh, when I realized the difficulties that she had, and I don't, I don't mean to criticize Harvard University, this is, would have been, I think, an academia in general uh, across the country, uh, the, the, the way women and immigrants were treated at the time, that uh, uh, when she, and I realized the, the pain and suffering she went through for her art, for what's important to her, that I really thought it was necessary to uh, honor her appropriately and uh, having connections here at the University of Chicago and being a graduate uh, uh, alumni of the uh, university, I thought this is an appropriate place to, do, uh, to, to honor her and organize the uh, first two and now the third uh, Maria Gimbutas Memorial Lectures. The first one was given by a professor, Colin Renfrew from, uh, from uh, Cambridge University. I won't get into details, but it really was a very historical presentation that he did uh, from this podium. Uh, the second presenter is Petra Gutenberg, who is with us here today. And, um, and, and uh, our, our third presenter, presenter will be, pre will be uh, uh, th third presenter will be introduced by Theo, uh, the acting director of the Oriental Institute. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much, uh, Orius, for uh, this introduction. Uh, I would also, on behalf of the OI, would like to welcome the uh, Lithuanian um, uh, representation here, the, 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 the consul and the other members of the Lithuanian community, um, the cultural attaché from, from New York. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, and I would also like to express my sincere thanks to Aureus for making these three, now the third one, the, the three Maria Gimbuta, Gimbutas lectures possible. Thank you so much uh, for, for that and giving us the opportunity and the honor to do it here in the Oriental Institute. Um, it's a real pleasure also for me tonight to introduce Professor Ruth Tringham. Um, she is professor of the Graduate School Anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley and received her PhD in archaeology at the University of Edinburgh. Ruth's research focuses on the transformation of early Neolithic agriculturalists in Europe and the establishment of households as the primary unit of social reproduction. She has directed and published archaeological excavations in Southeast Europe, Selevac and Opovo in Serbia and Podgorica in Bulgaria and most recently, the Bach project at Çatalhöyük, Turkey. That sounds very musical, uh, Bach, but it actually stands for uh, Berkeley archeologists at Çatalhöyük. Um, 
And um, she also was a project leader uh, on the prize-winning remixing Chattel Hoog project and the Okapi Island project, a mirror of Chattel Hoog in the virtual world of Second Life. Um, here again, I have to insert uh, Okapi. That sounds uh, to me that calls up uh, uh, safari uh, things, but actually it stands for um, open knowledge and the public interest, OKAPI. Um, okay, so I continue. Much of her recent and current feminist practice of archaeology incorporates recontextualizing digital primary archaeological data including media, to create their afterlives in the form of database narratives and recombinant histories about people, places, and things. In doing so, she combines the use of imagination, multi-sensorial experience, and gamification to engage a broader public in alternative scenarios about the prehistoric past. So far, the official uh, biography. Um, First of all, I should add that Professor Tringham was awarded the Royal Anthropological Institute in London, UK, 2021 President's Lifetime Achievement Award. Second, her, um, her, her uh, CV also includes a long section with research interests, which I found really interesting. There are the things that you would expect of an archaeology, archaeology method and theory, and so forth. But then a few lines down, you get to items like sensorial archaeology, archaeology interested in the senses, uh, soundscapes, smellscapes of ancient sites, extremely interesting, but also place. Imagination, fire, an important thing, natives and storytelling. And uh, that then brings us to tonight's lecture, Old Europe, House, Fire, the Goddess and Ambiguity. So it's a real pleasure and honor for me to uh, invite Professor Tringham to come up here and uh, I invite you to join me in uh, welcoming here to the OI. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, both of you. It's such a great honor to be invited to give the third Maria Gimbutas Memorial Lecture. In contrast to the two previous celebrants who spoke of history writ quite large, I am going to bring us back to an intimate scale of perception and interpretation. That is, two individual women separated in time by a few years separated by culture and history, but unknowingly linked by a love of and commitment to Euro East European prehistory. One of these is Maria Gimbutas, whose 100 year anniversary of her birth in Lithuania we are celebrating in this presentation. The other person is myself, brought up in the UK, who also ended up in the United States. Our histories intertwine in America and Eastern Europe, mostly without having direct co contact or conversation with each other. Because of the intimate scale of my story, I hope you won't be offended if I sometimes refer to Maria just by her first name. The nature of our intertwining and near misses in meeting is a fascinating tale for another time but I will give you a taste of it in an example here. Many of you may think that I am specialized in the prehistory of Anatolia through my most recent active participation in the long-term excavations at the Neolithic mound settlement of Çatalhöyük in Turkey. So it may come as a surprise, I actually hope it doesn't, that I spent the first 25 years of my professional career researching Neolithic archaeology of Central and Southeast Europe. This lovely figurine that you see here was excavated during the third season in 1978 of the very first archaeological project that I directed at Selivats, then in Yugoslavia, now in Serbia. A classic mid vincha culture settlement in the rolling hills of, of Shumadia, 
dating to the mid-fifth millennium BC. The clay figurine was accompanied by a tiny figurine made of alabaster that you can also see here, and a collection of perforated snail shells, both from the Black Sea area that may have been put together as a necklace to decorate the clay figurine. The figurine lay approximately at the arrow's position amidst the burned clay rubble of a wattle and daub house. By the way, this is a picture of how, to, how not to excavate a figurine. A hole has been dug underneath it. Naughty, naughty. Amongst Selevat's figurines, no single one is like another. Some are well made and well shaped according to the Vincha culture tradition. Some are shapeless blobs of clay. Some have diagnostic sexual features. Others have nothing. The figurine in the bottom left-hand corner with red paint was found in a clay-lined pit full of grain at Selevats in 1969, ex the excavations carried out by the National Museum in Belgrade. This find may have drawn Maria to visit Selevats. I know that she visited a few years before I first did in 1975. The site was only discovered in 1968. I think it's most likely that she visited in 1971 during the UISPP conference in Belgrade when she was between the Anzabegovo and Achillion projects. She would have heard the same story that I did about Selevats, that it was a city with houses that were so close together that a cat could jump from one roof to another. She was invited to start a project there, but rejected it in favor of Achillion, which she hoped would provide the earliest manifestation of old Europe. In 1975, I was also scouting without success for a project on the Mesolithic to early Neolithic transition, and was also offered Selevats. Even though it was a much later project than I was looking for, I opportunistically accepted and directed the project there with Dusan Krstic of the National Museum from 1976 to 79. By this time, Maria Gimbutas was in Scaloria, her last field project, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself there. In constructing my understanding of, of Maria Gimbutas' intellectual path and our intertwining, I owe much to the presentations in a conference held in Lithuania in a April this year, also in honor of her centennial anniversary, especially to two of Maria's students in her early UCLA days, Ernestine Elster and James Mallory, who shared memories of Maria's seminars and fieldwork experience. Maria, Maria Gimbutas's two early syntheses on the prehistory of Eastern Europe, the Neolithic in 1956 and the Bronze Age in 1965, were based on her encyclopedic multilingual knowledge from publications. It was during the Bronze Age research that she developed the concept of Proto-Indo-European speaking Kurgan migrations into Europe from the steppes of southern Russia. On the basis of these publications and research, she was appointed in 1963 to be Professor of European Prehistory at UCLA. You have heard more about her research on Kurgans and Indo-European languages in the previous two memor um, Maria Gimbutas memorial lectures. She continued to publish on this topic, but this was increasingly done in the context of the demise of her deepest love, old Europe. As often happens, it is the first-hand immersive experience of archaeological excavation that bonds us to the people and their history, their history of a specific place. Certainly this happened to me. Maria Gimbutas' history of fieldwork began immediately after her UCLA appointment. I suspect this was probably highly encouraged to, uh, to do this as an experience for graduate students. 
I know that at Harvard I had the same encouragement to do a project. There followed fieldwork and fast publication in a very rapid, sometimes overlapping sequence. Aubrey, Sitagri, Anza, Achillion, and then Scaloria. And here, Ernestine Elster has very nicely put Selevats in the middle of everything. I think I can do our little thing here, there. In his seminar, my understanding of, in, of, um, sorry, here, I think I went back to the wrong. Okay. In his seminar, Notebooks from Spring 1968, James Mallory says Maria favored the idea of the Aegean Balkan Neolithic as a largely independent area that owed little to diffusion and or migration from Anatolia. According to Ernestine Elster, it was after the first season of Sitagree in 1968 that Maria Gimbutas introduced the term Old Europe in her seminar based on the data from the excavation at Sitagree and comparative materials that she had visited in 1967. Her first published mention of Old Europe is in the first issue of the Journal of Indo-European Studies in 1973. In 1974, she used it in the title of her book, Gods and Goddesses, explaining that the term of old Europe is in, I quote, in recognition of the collective identity and achievement of the different cultural groups of the Neolithic and Chalcolithic Southeast Europe that have a more complex social organization than their Western and Northern neighbors. By 1991, in the civilization of the goddess, she included all the pre-Indo-European Neolithic cultures of Europe as part of old Europe. The ambition of the, the civilization of the goddess book is no less than the pre-Bronze Age prehistory of Europe. This is a fabulous achievement. In this lecture, I will keep to Maria Gimbutas's originally defined area that you see here, and this is the same area used by John Chapman over on the right in his 2020 book, Forging Identities, where he describes old Europe rather soullessly, it seems to me, not a cultural, and I quote, uh, not a cultural entity, but a geographically delimited region linked by distinctive long-term cult cultural practices. To provide some cohesion to the mosaic of archaeological cultures that comprise old Europe, I will focus on a few general empirical domains, clay, fire, house, village, and deposition. That these make sense to me in the restrictions of my 50-minute narrative. I'll give less emphasis to foodways, burials, lithics, and exchange networks. My presentation is a construction of what old Europe meant to Maria Gimbutas and means to myself and to a few others. I will immerse you at first in some of the richness of color and form that illustrate my narrative. But in most respects, this is not a speed course in old Europe. You can find that in Maria Gimbutas's own book, Civilization of the Goddess, and here are some others from uh, John Chapman, David Anthony, and Doug Bailey. Uh, fairly recent, so up to date. When you first experience the excavation of a place in old Europe, you are struck by the mass of stuff, the overwhelming majority of which is made in clay. In fact, my colleague Mirjana Stevanovic called this the age of clay. Clay is used for houses, for containers, and filling any amount of other everyday and special needs. It can be molded to any shape to satisfy practical requirements or imagined fantasies, and elaborated on the surface, surface to satisfy tradition or personal versioning of tradition. 
the ceramics are brilliant containers for short and long-term storage, containers for serving food, they're containers for presenting food, containers for cooking, decorated and elaborated in a myriad of styles specific to times and places. Clay was modeled into shapes that could not be created with any other material. Miniature furniture, spouts and sieves, weights for looms or netting, even pot handles that are recycled as polishers, clay cylinders with arms that are perforated to spread apart or thread fibers for suspension. There are clay balls and cones of different sizes that seem to be associated with heat, heating, perhaps as testers or heat retainers. And then there are these. These are the clay pieces that, along with figurines, form the focus of Maria's research, whose main purpose seems to be, sorry, well, I'm not going to use this little pointer anymore, I don't like it, <laughs> whose main purpose seemed to be a medium for a system of symbols or signs that she saw as the beginning of written communication. From the very beginning of her recognition of old Europe, Maria Gimbuta saw anthropomorphic and zoomorphic figurines as the most important, revealing the path to understanding the minds and beliefs of the prehistoric residents of old Europe. She saw in their variety the representation of a pantheon of supernaturals under the umbrella of the goddess, whom she believed provided the background to their everyday life. In this task, she was basing her conclusion not only on the form of the figure, but also the signs and symbols engraved or painted on their surfaces. Her books on the topic all the way to the civilization of the goddess inspired her readers, and they also provoked a large number of books and articles by archeologists who had their own interpretations. Douglas Bailey, has summarized many of these opinions in his 2005 book and his articles. His own thoughts are that figurines helped to create bodily awareness and identity. They helped stabilize and domesticate, in, domesticate individuals to conform to sedentary groups, especially in large aggregates of houses. Fire is the second domain a couple of years ago, I gave a lecture entitled Fire, Friend or Foe. There are many cultures around the world where fire is regarded as a foe, as in ours, for example, especially in the west of North America. There are others where it is regarded with awe, respected and used constructively as a friend. Old Europe, I think, was one of those cultures. Prowess in pyrotechnology was developed during the history of old Europe, as Maria Gimbutas noted in all her books. By analyzing their ceramics, figurines, and other clay objects, as well as copper and gold metallurgy, it is clear that the control of draft in ovens to, cre to create high temperatures and gorgeous ceramics were everyday skills that were developed to a very high degree in old Europe. They felt very comfortable with fire. They were able to reach 900 degrees centigrade in an anaerobic conditions to create the black burnished pottery of the Vincha culture over there on the far right, and 1,020 degrees centigrade to smelt copper quite early on, and then to reach 1,400 degrees centigrade to melt copper to produce the cast cast copper for the big axes that you see. In the, in the left-hand corner at the bottom here are some crucibles that we excavated at Selevats, and they were probably used to extract the copper from the ore. The bright orange and red rubble that you have been looking at is the burned clay daub remains of burned buildings that are characteristic of old European settlements. 
In fact, the rubble is how many of the non-mound settlements, like Selivats, are found by angry farmers whose fertile land is compromised by the ceramic-like mass of rubble brought up to the surface by their plows. Why are so many houses in old Europe burned that we can say it is a ubiquitous, though not universal, feature? In my introduction to Neolithic fieldwork at Selivats, with my Western urban attitude to fire, if I thought anything about the fire events, I thought something bad must have happened. The popular explanation for the burned houses was that it was accidental or deliberate as an act of aggression. By the end of the Selevats project in 1979, however, burned houses had become the main topic of research interest for me and my colleague, Mirjana Stevanovic. My second Serbian project at Opovo from 1983 to 89 and Mirjana's PhD project was designed to investigate burned houses and what I was now referring to as the burned house horizon of Southeast Europe. The houses of old Europe were constructed of timber frames, strengthened with wattling that you see up there on the top right corner, and thickly daubed inside and outside with clay. The gabled roof is generally assumed to be of reeds or straw. The clay for the daub was dug from pits near the house that were then served as waste depos deposit areas. The houses are between six to eight meters wide and of various lengths, some with two rooms as at Divostein that you see down there in the, uh, at the bottom, or later, in, as in Opovo, one room. Many have floors that are lined with timbers that you see over on the far bottom right corner, and these are then daubed, making them very solid, weatherproof, and warm. Ovens for baking and heating are usually constructed inside the house. Houses of this kind could last, especially if maintained, and unlike the poor uh, example down there in the bottom left-hand corner, these inside, the, they could last for maybe two generations or three generations. Houses aggregated in large, into large villages are characteristic of old Europe. They are arranged in rows or circles. Some settlements created by repeated occupation of a specific restricted location form mounds of debris called tells. Others are flat sites whose presence is obvious by the burned daub discovered by farmers or by advanced geophysical prospection, which can find both burned and unburned houses. As you see here at the site of Maidanets in the Ukraine, and um, one of the, it's one of the Ukrainian Tripillion mega sites that you might have heard about. The big question in a tell or a flat settlement is to know which houses existed at the same time and especially which ones were abandoned or destroyed by fire or otherwise at the same time. What you need is to be able to see the stratigraphic relations between houses. And here at Maidanets, the traditional excavation strategy of broad spatial exposure without control profiles has made that a bit difficult. Assuming that the house was an individual event, where, where would you build the house replacement? At mounds, at mound site like Chatalhuyuk, with, with mud brick, oh, sorry, At Chatelhuyuk, which has mud brick architecture, they would use the old walls as foundations for a new house with vertical superimpos uh, superimposition, like you see in the top uh, case of the, blue, of the blue picture there. So, um, so in, with, they would use this, but when you burn a wattle, they would use this if, if it's unburned 
or if uh, on a tell site, you can see that. But when you burn a wattle and daub house, you cannot use the burned remains as foundations for various reasons. We suggested they replace the burned house with a new house nearby, but without overlap, as in the bottom case of the blue picture. Without burning, a new floor could be built on top of the old one. Posts could be reused, at, but it would likely be invisible to future archaeologists. We designed the project at Opovo, which was a flat site, not only to investigate deliberate or accidental burning, but also to identify single or multiple coeval burning events. At Opovo, we excavated very carefully, as you can see in the picture there, um, around the bur burned rubble and retained profiles, control profiles, across the site and its building. And I believe we were able to show that the two houses in the latest layer of the excavated area were not burned at the same time, although others would argue against this. In fact, it is possible that these two houses represented a situation of house replacement of one house by another at a nearby location. Between the, the period of burning the orange house, that's the that's the earliest one that you see in the, in the plan there on the left. And the burning of the uppermost house in the blue, enough time seems to have elapsed for another house, the green one, to be built and for the blue generation to be able to partially overlap the, the earlier orange house and to have forgotten while they're doing that where the orange house dug its well. After burning house two, the rubble all fell through and filled the void of the well. That's just a little, little architectural story there. The formation of tells in settlement mounds in southeast Europe, such as this one on the left at Caranovo or Vincia Bello Burdo on the right, rarely involves the kind of vertical superimposition seen at Chatal. But a series of floors of unburned clay can be seen superimposed one on top of the other on both tells and also on flat sites, dating especially to the earlier Neolithic levels in Serbia. The unburned ones show up as a kind of yellowish clay. Their floors show up as a yellowish clay. But we can't really tell a lot from these from these dramatic profiles beyond the fact that burning events on tells started very early on in the history of old Europe, seen by the, the layers of red there, of orange, uh, down at the bottom. The, st the strategy of excavation on a tell, as in flat sites, can restrict or enable us to gain data about house replacements and settlement history. The strategy of going for a large profile is as restrictive as a strategy of a large exposure without profiles. At Gomolava, the tell site you see here, the archaeologists have gained an idea of the settlement plan, as you can see from those, the, the houses there, but have no idea of the detailed relationship between the burned houses beyond being at the same building horizon, meaning it has to be assumed rather than demonstrated that these houses existed and burned at the same time. If as an archeologist, your investigation is about the life histories of people, places and things, then the act of deposition, which is another of our domains, becomes very interesting. What was the intention, if any, of the depositor when looking at the wealth of movable objects, mostly fragmented in a burned house, your first response might be that these reflect the frozen activities of the house as a living entity. John Chapman, who wrote this uh, recent book, also wrote a book in 2000 called Fragmentation, where he made a very significant contribution when he suggested 
that the placement of artifacts was intentionally prepared in the building before or after burning as a mortuary set, a set for the death of the house, laid out in the funeral pyre of the house as an idealized representation of the household or community. Apart from the drama and emotion of the burning event itself, fire transforms the daub skin of the building into a fragmented hard material that after thousands of years will not disappear. So to burn a house involved an in intention to make the ground unusable for agriculture or for house building, but a very great long lasting memorial it made. Even the deposition of food and other wastes can involve selection and choices based on practical or symbolic values. I also include human burial as part of the deposition domain. In Europe, with so many absent bodies, as old Europe, that there are, in forging identities, there are few other places in prehistoric Europe with so many absent bodies as in old Europe, is what John Chapman says. Apart from the exceptions, such as a, a very famous site called Unitsite, there are no human remains in the burned houses. On the Black Sea coast, however, inhumations in cemeteries had been an exceptional tradition in the area from Hamangia culture times. The cemetery of Varna near the Black Sea is extraordinary for the hierarchy visible among its graves that demonstrate a spectacular array of skilled metallurgical, ceramic, and stone crafts with evidence of access to a variety of semi-precious stones. So we come to the regional variability of old Europe. It was always recognized by Maria Gimbutas, as it is by the ver different cultural names given by local archaeologists. The variability is demonstrated especially by styles of ceramic forms and decoration and, and figurines. There are broad divisions between the West Balkans, or rather the Central Balkans in this case, and the East Balkans. The Black Sea coast and the lowest Danube area, as you see on the red circle there, just as, Va as Varna demonstrates, is an area that was always an exception to the rest of old Europe, certainly relating to its coastal location and access to, step to the steppes and even Caucasus networks. The chart on the right anchors you in a familiar way of thinking. This is as close as I get to a course on old Europe, by the way. So this anchors you in a familiar way of thinking about culture history. What the left-hand image shows, however, is that there are important shifts during this period in what seems to be the growth and creative focus across Southeast Europe. I have grossly simplified what, uh, John, the scheme that John Chapman wrote in his new book, Forging Identities. Starting with the earliest pioneer Neolithic farming settlements moving northwards, not very far and not very far, fast for a thousand years, there was an explosive growth around 5300 BC in which large settlement aggregations fixed in place for several generations, a proliferation in the use of the local clays and pyrotechnology skills to create the features that we identify as old Europe. There were, for instance, there are more substantial buildings, more ceramics, more figurines, even more brilliant in their variation, an intensive use of the local mineral sources, more burning of houses, but less frequent burials in settlements. This early intensification was located especially in the West or Central Balkans, where Selavats is, for example. At about 4,700 BC, the focus of the exchange networks and center of intensified production gradually moved eastwards during the fifth millennium. At the same time began a long period of transformation that you see by the black, 
starting in the West Balkans, seen in the importance of the burial domain. I'm going to give you two rather complicated uh, culture names here, but they are demonstrated by the Tisa Polga and Bodrog Keresto culture. I love the name, so I had to tell you. And smaller settlements in the later Vinci settlements. Meanwhile, in the East Balkans, which had by no means been dormant before, th before 4,700, they reached heights of material brilliance afterwards with a variety of settlement forms in tells and flat sites and a resource network that provided exotica from a large variety of locations. There too, however, by 4000 BC, that's after seven, only 700 years, smaller houses and settlements with fewer materials deposited and more focus on burial deposition, that black again, impoverished the rich archaeological evidence of the domestic domain of the previous 2,000 years. But in the eastern margin of old Europe, the U in the Ukraine, not only were the old domestic traditions kept, but they were intensified as seen in the mega sites of the Tripilia culture in, during the fourth millennium. Some of the domains that I didn't discuss were of great significance to Maria. Religion and gender, both based on figurines. The symbolic system based on the script of the signs and symbols on the clay. And social organization. By bringing in these domains, even without being able to prove them to most other archaeologists by reference to the archaeological data, she nevertheless alerted everyone for the first time to the importance of considering in old Europe people as gendered actors engaging in social relations and energized by a belief system. The narrative that she has used to make sense of the rich archaeological remains of old Europe is a heroic one of, of the evolution of a world that from about 6,500 BC to 4,500 BC, 2,000 years, and I'm quoting now Maria, had undergone a peaceful evolution and by the end of this time achieved what could properly be called a golden age of old European civilization. She continues, communities achieved populations of many thousands. Metallurgy was practiced producing copper and gold tools jewelry and symbols that display a complete mastery of these media. Old European ceramicists produced pottery so refined in execution that it would not be matched for thousands of years. They'd even developed a form of writing. Here's Maria a little more. The focus of life for these people was religion, the perpetual functioning of the cycle of life death and regeneration, embodied by a central feminine force, the goddess. The tens of thousands of figurines, the rich symbolism, all attest to the ideology of these people. Religion pervaded every aspect of life. These achievements were attained without the use of force. The society was gynocentric and matrilineal. The central role of the women in the family, clan, reflected the central role of the goddess in religion. I'm ending Maria's quotes here. The narrative is the more dramatic for the civilization of old Europe being cut down in its prime. Around 4,000, and now I'm quoting Maria again, around 4,300 BC, the continuity and fabric of old European civilization was torn by the Kurgan culture by pastoralists whom Maria had identified in her earlier career as Proto-Indo-European speakers, a patriarchal originating in the steppes to the east. The implication of this story is that without the Kurgans, old Europe might have continued to exist and develop for a very long time. So here we can see huge transformations. This is kind of showing you the archaeological basis to this. They can be seen in all of the empirical domains of old Europe, mostly in terms of their absence, 
especially with clay, much less clay, no figurines, no house burning, small ephemeral various materials, less or no daub. The networks is exchanged is much less um, and done with new sources. The village, there are no tells, uh, flat settlements, few houses, um, the, the uh, burial de deposition, there are many human burials. That's a big plus, it's one of the few pluses. Uh, inhumations in cemeteries and so on. But there are, no, there are no burials in houses and no structured deposition. And fire, I've suggested, is a foe for the Kurgan, for this after the transition. Fire becomes a foe. Pyrotechnology has lost skills. There's no complex ceramics, no copper metallurgy of the same kind. So these huge transformations in these domains, what caused this change? Maria has said that there is no other explanation possible for these cultural and physical disruptions of tradition than from the Kurgan inventions. Ancient DNA stud data is open to multiple interpretations, though many suggest that Maria's Kurgan theory has been repudiated by them. Other archaeologists, however, offer other interpretations. John Chapman and Biserka Gaidaska, working especially with the Trupilska culture and the Vinci culture, have proposed a model that draws together all the domains, both testable and untestable, of old Europe in what they call the big other. And I'm quoting here, we think of the big other as a suite of beliefs which was materialized in practices involving houses, pottery, and figurines. A ubiquitous shared symbolic order which existed only in so far as people believed in it. It is something which is sufficiently general and significant to attract the support of most members of society, but at the same time, something sufficiently ambiguous to allow the kinds of localized alternative interpretations that avoid constant schismatic behavior." End quote. Thus they explain the demise of old Europe as the breakdown or disruption of the values of the big other, an ideological disengagement with the house, the household, and the communal domestic place and its tasks caused by challenges from a proliferation of other life ways and world views through contact presumably with other networks in which an engagement with domains that forefronted human individ individuals and their identity in life and death that took precedence. And then for another making sense of old Europe is my own, which in 1990 I put forward a model based on my excavations of Selivats and Opovo, but adaptable to old Europe in general. I suggested that a key change at 5,300 BC in old Europe was the emergence of long-lasting households as autonomous units in villages, making possible larger population aggregates and increased long-term commitment to a place. This model that is based on ethnographic research suggested that households were not egalitarian, as Maria had suggested, but had short-term inequalities based on access to raw materials and production processes. In this kind of social formation, where there is a flexible and temporary basis of both power and inequality, there are real limits to the number of households that can interact together in an aggregated settlement. Without some centralizing hierarchical structure through which the households could be organized into an integrated as opposed to aggregated political unit, it would have been impossible to continue their trajectory of intensification of production and growth of population. I propose that by the end of the occupation of Selevats and other large late Neolithic settlements, these organizational limits were reached. I suggested that the solution that was chosen was not hierarchy, but fissioning the social group 
along household lines, and that smaller hamlets comprising one or two households were established in marginal areas, and that Opovo was one such hamlet. You can see in the picture of Opolo, Opovo, if you look carefully, that the excavation is on a slight hillock that rises above what is basically marshland. Very marginal, very different from the agricultural land of Shumadia. I speculated that it was less powerful households who broke away from the rigors of tradition, where they created new networks of alliances and economic strategies such as hunting and pasturing, over which the seniors of the large Neolithic villages did not have a monopoly of knowledge. In such a mo the model, the decrease in figurine manufacture could be caused by the fading of the traditional rituals and their symbols, which had maintained the large aggregated venture settlements. This transformational process from anti-establishment movement to become the establishment itself may have taken several hundred years. This is a household scale story, but just like the goddess and big other, it is nevertheless a story based on the archeological fragments of old Europe and the imagination. So many interpretations, so many theories, scenarios and stories, how to find the truth about what happened. In many respects, these models agree with each other about how the houses were built, where the copper book ore came from, what the figurines were made of. The ambiguity enters when we try to go beyond the certainties of the empirical data. Who lived in the houses? Meaning, what is the meaning and meaningfulness of the artifacts? What was their worldview, their values, their beliefs, their gendered practices, their social relations? With these questions and more, we have to live with ambiguity, which means that we will never know with any certainty. What, says Maria, what sets Maria's interpretations apart from those of other archaeologists is her certainty. She was confident that her intuition and artistic sensibilities would lead her to the right answer to the past reality. She bravely wrote her beautiful books in the face of the ambiguity of archaeological data. She felt figurines can speak for themselves. Their meaning and significance can be known. Maria created archaeomythology, the discipline, to set her work apart from conventional archaeology and place it in a discipline where it could be nurtured and act as an inspiration for research that combines archaeology, mythology, ethnology, historical linguistics, comparative religion, and so on, and action to make the world a more spiritual place according to the principles she writes here. But as you can see from these models of old Europe that I presented, Maria is not the only one with what Doug, Douglas Bailey calls anecdotal or untestable arguments. The models of John Chapman and myself are both about domains that cannot be tested. The uh, worldview, for example, John's big other, social relations, my household squabbles about control. So the dilemma as an archaeologist is not, not as an, not an, not as an archaeomythologist, how do you take your investigation any further beyond the restrictions of what the data can tell you? In other words, how do you increase the plausibility of your argument? In these last few minutes, I want to tell you a little about the middle road between uncritical enthusiasm on the one hand and restricting yourself to obviously testable scenarios. It is called the celebration of, the amb of ambiguity and is a favorite feature of the feminist practice of archaeology. So we'll talk about the squeeze the lemon of the data to the max, practice multiscalar imagining and interpretation, make your investigation and interpretive process transparent, making clear what you know and what you don't know. This chart shows the method that I use throughout my professional career to squeeze the lemon of data to the max. It enables me to be explicit about what I know for certain, more or less, and what I don't know, and perhaps never will be able to know. Some call it middle-range research or empirical hypothesis test building. 
It involves finding ways to use the properties of the archaeological remains to gain tested information by experiment or analysis that can then be used to support more general speculative theorizing. This is, was why in studying figurines, for example, I focused on the archaeological context of the figurines and investigated the materials and means of their manufacture and deposition, their use lives, enabling me to make a series of linking inferences to the conclusion that their variability is immense, but I could empirically go no further. Earlier, I talked about the question or mystery why burned houses dominated the archaeology of Europe. I described our excavation strategy at Opovo designed to study if the fires were single or communal events. We excavated the burned rubble with what resembled a modern arson investigation to test whether the fires were deliberately set or accidentally by investigating temperature of burning. It was very high over a thousand degrees, which points to arson, and to find evidence of hot spots that you can see there in the map, <clears throat> and to produce fire maps themselves. From this time-consuming effort, we concluded that these houses at Opovo were each burned in separate events, deliberately, helped by adding fuel and carefully orchestrated. In Anyway, that was as far as we could go in terms of the certainty of scientifically proven empirical data. Beyond that was speculative interpretation, which could make, take many forms. Because of their ubiquity and absence of human remains among the rubble and my speculation on the household basis of society, the, the interpretation to which we gave the greatest plausibility was that these fires were funeral rituals for the house itself. So the interpretive or anecdotal models of Maria, John Chapman, and myself have been conceived at different scales. Maria's at a continental scale, John's at a more regional scale. Such large-scale models, history writ large, where the details are blurred, seem to be more acceptable or closer to reality, where by essentializing specifics, even genders, they can become somehow familiar. My model tries on the one hand to convert these large-scale models to everyday practice in the village or the household. On the other hand, it works from the bottom up of village tensions and details to build a larger scale trajectory of change. It is much harder to bring your imagination to focus on the scale of dramas within households and the village. Life at an intimate scale is so complicated. I find you have to start with questions. Who carries the heaviest load and how? Who fetches the water? Where from? Who starts the fire to burn the house? Was this a great honor? Who made this particular figurine? Who touched it? How? What? What sounds accompanied its breaking? And once I start, the questions pile one on the other. The answer to the questions have to come from a multitude of sources for my imagination, from history, ethnography, social anthropology, science fiction, my experience of village life in Serbia. It is at the intimate scale of inside the household where the stories are the richest, however, and require the most informed imagination. To look through the eyes of an individual household member, a younger woman, an older man, a woman with a damaged hip, a child, there is enormous space for devising alternative small scenarios here, but only informed transparently by our imaginations and by the fragmentary empirical evidence we have of prehistory. This leads into my third and final way to celebrate ambiguity. My first published imagined narrative was in 1991, but the process how I got there started at a conference in 1987 about women and production. I was asked to incorporate women, or at least the issue of gender, into my household model of old Europe that I've just told you. By this time, Maria had long been the first person to make women an intricate part of her old Europe story. As an archaeologist, I was very nervous of doing this, since women seemed entirely untestable and thus not a legitimate part of my practice. But this conference led to my own epiphany. You mightn't have heard the whole story. 
What, did you, what do you see in, when you think about the household? I say, I see faceless blobs. The other person says, well, try harder. About feminist, what's my own epiphany then about feminist practice of archaeology and the legitimacy of talking about both testables and untestables? According to feminist practice, knowledge gained through scientific inference could legitimately be combined with inform informatively imagined narratives about, for example, the women, children, and men in those households to create plausible scenarios. But the requirement was to make my thought processes transparent, to be explicit as to what was scientifically gained knowledge and how the imagined fiction was drawn out of that. I used digital media to juxtapose these two different kinds of knowledge, science and speculative narrative. Speculative narrative. It was important that my audience grasp that these scenario fragments were not showing how life was lived in the village, but how it might have been. I love the challenge of constructing history or prehistory at this intimate scale, where you have to bring the imagination into play, building from the available physical evidence to give names and personalities, as I've done to my people over there at the human, human scale or scale of a human lifetime. We know they had names and personalities, but we have no idea what. Because they, and this has been my favorite part of archaeological research since then. So the past is always seen through the eyes of the present. As an archaeologist of prehistory, I look at the past through a double lens, myself and the remains and ruins that are silent witnesses that we have to work hard to hear. My own lens, like all of yours and like Maria's is, was, is colored by my various standpoints that I have on the world, the present and uh, that I have on the present and on the past. Maria's need was to use the archeological record, especially the figurines and symbols, to tell the story of the rise and demise of the peaceful world of old Europe, where people lived in harmony with each other and nature. My need is, <coughs> my need is for voiceless voices and taken for granted to be exposed and examined by critical analysis I don't like to generalize about groups of people and places when in reality they are made up of an ever-changing mosaic of communities and scenes. I value ritual in our lives as markers of time and events and con continuity. And I regularly aim for the unexpected by turning to tr traditional expectation on its head. For example, I chose a female to orchestrate the burning of a house instead of the expected male leader. In my stories, I have even given inanimate archaeological artifacts, an Opovo house, a Chatelhuyuk basket, a voice, but I try never to lose sight of the empirical archaeological data out of which they are drawn. I respect Maria Gimbutas's standpoints. I know that she would have, have, have appreciated my love of folk music and village food and rituals, but I also know that she would not have approved of my celebration of ambiguity. But she might have enjoyed my tiny stories, with her final placing her work in the discipline of archaeomythology. We might have had a fruitful dialogue about our different standpoints on the past. Who knows? Thank you. Uh, last week, I happened to be in Lithuania, Vilnius, and had some matters to take care of at the Lithuanian National Museum. The director of the museum asked me to pass along a, the uh, current exhibit catalog for you uh, just a few weeks ago uh, to honor Maria Gimbutas and her 100 year uh, celebration of her birth. Um, a special exhibit was established, really a very beautiful one. Uh, they obtained old uh, Europe uh, artifacts, a lot of figurines from museums across Eastern Europe. And uh, none of these were actually excavated by Maria herself, but from that time period that you saw, uh, talked about today. And uh, it's a very beautiful exhibit, and the catalog uh, was just published recently. It's in English and in Lithuanian, and so here's a copy for yourself.
For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.